Does coffee raise your risk for high blood pressure? A cohort study had no obvious effect on blood pressure after 10 years of consumption. So all of you coffee drinkers out there, rejoice. Um, it is known that it can raise your blood pressure transiently, but the long-term data on hypertension was not really discovered. So in this study uh, from Italy, they looked at 1,400 participants who were stratified by their daily coffee consumption, none, moderate, or heavy, and then they did office, home, and 24-hour ambulatory BP readings for each participant at baseline and after 10 years. The three groups were somewhat different at baseline. For example, heavy coffee consumers were younger, more likely to smoke, and less likely to be taking antihypertensive medications. After adjustment for these confounders, the only significant finding was slightly lower mean office systolic blood pressure in heavy consumers compared with moderate consumers and non-consumers, both at baseline and 10-year follow-up. So one thing I want to point out here is these patients, um, you know, they adjusted for these confounding factors, but you always have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, ideally, all three groups are pretty similar at baseline, or you've done some kind of randomization to ensure all the groups are similar, and then they have an intervention done. Like that's the key standard of evidence, right? In this case, if your patients in this first group, the heavy consumers, tend to be younger, well, of course, their blood pressure is probably going to be lower uh, compared to an older population. And we don't know how much younger were they. Were they 20 years younger compared to the no coffee consumers? Um, these are all questions that you would have to dig a little bit deeper into by reading the actual article itself. But overall, the uh, conclusion is that patients can be re reassured that a daily coffee habit is not likely to affect their blood pressure. Moreover, a recent large observational study suggested that coffee consumption isn't associated with excess risk for cardiovascular cardiac arrhythmias. That's actually very interesting because I think all of us have been taught that alcohol really increases your risk for AFib. And I, I think logically, a lot of people also assume that uh, coffee or caffeine will increase your risk for AFib as well. I mean, it really makes sense. You're getting more tachycardic. It's probably more likely you'd you know, jump into AFib at some point. But uh, apparently, there's not really a clear connection. So that's very interesting to note. Should we use ACE inhibitors and ARBs in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease? A meta-analysis suggests that these drugs slow progression of stage 4 or 5 CKD. This is something I would really love to see more of because I think so many times we have patients, their creatinine is 2, 2.4, 2.5, and we're like, oh, GDMT for their heart failure, we're not doing any ACE inhibitor or ARB because you know their renal function is bad. Or even if somebody just has CKD alone and hypertension, you know, their blood pressure is like 160, so many times we are like, oh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs are not an option. But actually, I remember learning this, you know, the evidence has always shown that regardless of how severe your kidney disease is, you pretty much would benefit from uh, an ACE or an ARB. It's going to cause reno protection, right? It's going to slow your chronic kidney disease or the progression of your chronic kidney disease. It's hard though, because when everybody's practicing a certain way, everybody's, you know, being a little bit more cautious because the last thing you want to do is do harm, right? And start an ACE inhibitor in somebody who has a creatinine of 2.5 and they come back in a week and they're in like acute renal failure and they like need to be started on dialysis. Like that would be like everybody's worst nightmare. So I can totally see why people are very hesitant to do it. It would be interesting to see if, you know, more guidelines came out about it and encouraged people to start it more aggressively for higher CKD, um, you know, you know, higher levels of uh, chronic kidney disease. I think that would maybe be a good encouragement that would help people feel more comfortable with that. Patients with CKD stage four or five who initiated ACE inhibitors or ARBs were significantly less likely to progress to dialysis, 12% versus 7 17% annually, number needed to treat uh, 20, but mortality was similar, about 3% annually. Unfortunately, these researchers were unable to assess adverse events such as hyperkalemia or acute kidney injury. Nevertheless, the results are compelling and should encourage us to initiate these medications in patients with advanced CKD. So definitely looking for some more evidence on this front, as well as some more guidelines. And I think in the future, people may start to feel a little bit more comfortable starting ACE inhibitors in people with pretty bad kidney disease. Just like how um, I think over time, there's going to be a little bit more of a push to keeping the metformin on in the hospital, or at least resuming metformin in the hospital. I think that's also something that should be, um, you know, coming to light in the next decade or so. 
Use of aspirin for VTE prophylaxis after total knee arthroplasty is increasing. In an observational study, VTE occurred less commonly with aspirin than with anticoagulants. This is a very interesting study for me because all the time we are dealing with these post-op patients. You know, a lot of hospitalists have to deal, you know, with surgical patients uh, because we're doing uh, co-management services, which has been shown to improve outcomes. And so it's nice to have this collaborative, um, you know, partnership with the sur surgeons. And uh, one contention point, I think, a lot of times has been, man, everybody's on aspirin for their DVT prophylaxis. That's not really like a true anticoagulant. You know, we don't feel that comfortable with it. We, I mean, we're fine with it, but we also are like, ah, oh, this doesn't feel right. But um, looking at the evidence, it looks like aspirin actually does do a good job uh, stopping DVTs in these patients and has a lower risk of bleeding. So very, very interesting. The use of low-dose aspirin prophylaxis has increased from 8% to 55% of cases over 2012 to 2022. And the 90-day incidence of postoperative VTE dropped from 2.3 to 1.1 for DVT and 1.7 to 1.1% for PE. All right, and glucocorticoid-induced adrenal insufficiency, a new guideline. So uh, this is a new guideline sponsored by the European Society of Endocrinology and the Endocrine Society. And it's kind of asking, when do we need to start tapering um, steroids or when can we just discontinue them? If a patient's been on steroids for two, three weeks, do we have to taper it or can we just stop it? And how fast should we taper? So the key points here in this new guideline shows that tapering is unnecessary when treatment duration has been less than three to four weeks, regardless of the dose. Even if they're on high dose steroids, you know, uh, it sounds like based on this guideline, we don't have to taper. When the duration of steroid therapy has been greater than three to four weeks, the dose should be tapered to minimize steroid withdrawal symptoms and to promote recovery of the HPA axis. So when the daily steroid dose is high, greater than 40, a weekly decrement of five to 10 milligrams is recommended. When it's low, a smaller decrement is recommended, for example, 2.5 milligrams every one to four weeks, if it's 10 to 20 uh, milligrams, and one milligram decrement every one to four weeks when the daily dose drops below 10 milligrams. That's a very, very long, very slow taper, um, much faster than a patient I recently saw who had come in on a taper and they were going down by uh, 10 milligrams every three days. <laughs> So uh, that's actually something useful for me to know that the, the taper recommendations are so, so prolonged. Patients taking a long-acting steroid, such as dexamethasone, should be switched to a shorter-acting steroid, prednisone or hydrocortisone, for tapering. When the taper has reached a daily physiologic dose, 4 to 6 milligrams of prednisone equivalent, the authors recommend either further tapering or obtaining a morning serum cortisol level. If the level is greater than 10, the steroid can be stopped. If the level is less than 10, tapering continues and testing is repeated weeks to months later. Routine dynamic testing with ACTH stimulation is discouraged. The authors recommended it only in selected instances of uncertainty about adrenal status. So why don't we make some Anki cards on this? So Conan, PGY5 now. Oh my gosh, it's going by quickly. Um, so when sh is tapering necessary for, for prolonged steroids after three to four weeks per the European Society of Endocrinology and the Endocrine Society. Greater than 40, then taper by um, five to 10 milligrams per week. Less than 40, t then taper by 2.5 milligrams per, per one to four weeks. Less than 10, then taper by one milligram uh, what is it? One milligram every one to four weeks. That's such a slow taper for one to four weeks. Once at physiologic dose, four to six milligrams daily, then can stop or can check serum cortisol level. If greater, greater than 10, then can stop. If less than 10, then continue taper and repeat testing in the future. What is considered a physiologic dose of prednisone? Four to six milligrams. I'm just adding this in because it's an interesting piece of uh, knowledge for me to know and may come in handy in the future. So I love making little notes about things I learn, you know, reading these articles. That tapering schedule will also come in very handy for me in the future. You know, I can just very easily look up tapering in my Anki cards and then I can see what 
their recommendations for tapering is for somebody who's been on steroids for like a year or something or been on steroids for like three months. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed the articles today. Let me know what you guys think about the articles down in the comments below. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.